I'm very familiar with Capcom games from the 90s to the mid 2000s since I grew up with games like Mega Man X, Street Fighter 2, Resident Evil, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but there was plenty of Capcom games that I passed at the time, like the game series we're going to talk about today. This is the Devil May Cry HD Collection. May Cry HD Collection. This one was kindly gifted to me by Scarlet, who spent $19.79. I honestly know nothing of Devil May Cry prior to me working on this video. Even though my friends and I did a complete Let's Play of the first game, I honestly remember one thing, and that is... I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! And, uh, that's it. Because prior to this, my only other experiences with the Devil May Cry series was... And funny enough, in Capcom's own Beautiful Joe. Uh, only the PS2 version, though. Say the word. Devil May Cry's a rockin', baby, yeah! And with the only Devil May Cry game I played was 2013's DMC Devil May Cry. Because it was free off of PlayStation Plus back in 2014. And uh, DMC wasn't received well. And I can see why. Maybe something for later. Also, I'm not super into the hack and slash genre, with the only hack and slash games I've played being Bayonetta, Metal Gear Rising, and God of War 1 and 2. And that's pretty much it. So, with my history out of the way, this will be a three-part review covering each game in the collection. Devil May Cry, Devil May Cry 2, and ending with Devil May Cry 3, Dante's Awakening. Now let's rock, baby. Let's rock, baby. Now I have to make a quick note of the development of Devil May Cry, since it's actually a super interesting one. Originally, the game was developed as a version of Resident Evil 4, and playing it, it uh, it's very Resident Evil-ish, that's for sure. But the game would end up as it is, and Resident Evil 4 was completed and released four years later. Anyway. Devil May Cry was released in October of 2001. The game's almost 21 years old, mate. Let that sink in. Directed by the man Hideki Kamiya, director of Resident Evil 2, and would later direct Beautiful Joe and Bayonetta. It's a hack and slash. See enemies, kill enemies. Basic, but there's no need for more. The game is really fun, but it's a really early 2000s PS2 game, so it had some H mechanics like a pre-play static camera, no lock-on, and so bad yet so good English dub. Finally, a 
was getting tired of playing your childish game. Anyway, let's get to the story. The game begins with this monologue while in the background, Nightmare from Soul Calibur is swinging around the Soul Edge around. A lady drops out of the moon into a city next to a building with the words, Devil May Cry. And inside the building, there is our protagonist of the story, Dante, who is an underground mercenary according to the PS2 manual. This edgelord over here is currently dealing with the retail environment by telling people the store is closed. Suddenly, Bike! And this is that chick who appeared from the moon, and she gives out some details on Dante's past, and she has a job for Dante. And, uh... In that case, you should be used to this sort of thing. <laughs> Are you really the son of the legendary Dark Knight Sparta? Didn't your daddy teach you how to use a sword? Sword. <laughs> Time to go to work, guys. Even as a child, I had powers. There's demonic blood in me. Yeah, some of the cutscenes are a bit over the top, and they are glorious. Turns out this girl's name is Trish. She's here to get help from Dante, and she takes off her sunglasses, and she kind of maybe looks like this woman in the picture. Trish explains that 20 years ago, Mundus, some dude who has been resurrected and wants to open the gate to the underworld in Rockford Island. I mean, uh, Mallet Island. Trish tells Dante to go to the castle, and he enters. And here's where I'm going to kind of speed through the story, because a lot of plot really doesn't happen until, like, later in the game. So, yeah. So while exploring through the castle, he finds a sword impaled through a statue. And that sword impels Dante. Uh, he gets up through the sword, and, uh... Okay, cool. He gets the Alistair. Later, while trying to solve a Resident Evil puzzle, the MacGuffin tells him to leave, so he leaves. Finds the pedestals that tells him to go back. Okay. The Phantom is the name of this thing. And a boss fight ensues. Once defeated, it just crawls into the ground. He later appears again through a hallway. Much later, Dante enters a room with a mirror and a statue. He impales the statue with a sword and drops an object. Then... The mirror Dante walks out of the mirror and turns into this guy. This black knight is named Nello Angelo. That's what the manual says. He beckons Dante outside and they have a fight. Once defeated, Angelo takes the advantage on Dante, but then Dante's pendant slips out and Nilo Angelo starts freaking out. And he fucks off. Later in the sewers, Dante is collecting an item for another Resident Evil puzzle and then the phantom appears again. Heading towards the roof of the castle, the phantom appears one last time and a fight ensues one last time. Finally, once defeated, the Phantom falls through the ceiling and gets impaled by the statue. The Phantom, in his dying grasps, asks if he is Sparta. And Dante says, You're right. I'm his son, Dante. Sweet dreams. Now with the Phantom fully gone, he is finally able to leave the castle and heads towards this Colosseum. He isn't able to enter the Colosseum at the moment, and he moves on, where after a platforming challenge, he acquires the gauntlets named Ifrit. <laughs> Heading back to the Colosseum, a giant bird thing spawns from lightning named the Griffin. Any boss fight ensues. Once defeated, he kind of just leaves. 
Alrighty then. Much later, while Dante is trying to solve another Resident Evil puzzle, Nilo Angelo appears once more and gets promptly defeated. Chapters later, Dante hops onto the shipwreck and the ship starts moving, and the griffin appears one more time, and again flux off after he's defeated. Time passes and Dante is finally able to enter the Colosseum, and the griffin appears for the final time. And finally defeated, the griffin gets crushed. With its dying words, he presses Dante and asks Mundus if he can get more power, and Mundus appears, and he tells the griffin that he failed, and kills the griffin himself. Trish appears and stares at Dante while he is having a crisis. He's the one that took the life of my mother, my brother, sure. Dante heads back to the castle and has to deal with this gooey thing called the Nightmare. He hops in the thing and inside is the Phantom again. Once the Phantom's Phantom is defeated, it dealt a decent amount of damage. And now this is where the real boss fight begins. Once defeated, it kind of just melts to the ground. Traveling around, he gets to the ceremony room where Nilo Angelo appears. He takes off his mask, showing his true self. A uh, pretty cool fight happens, and with a couple good slices, he goes down and he disappears, and drops another part of the amulet. Turns out, Nilo Angelo was Dante's twin brother, Virgil. Virgil, Dante, happy birthday. Mundus informs to Trish that Virgil has been defeated. With both parts of the amulets connected, it converts Dante's sword into the Soul Edge. I mean, the Sparta. Welcome to the new stage of history. The legend will never die. Heading back, Nightmare appears again, and gets defeated. Heading back to where Nightmare spawned originally, Dante opens up the gate and goes through the underworld. Inside the underworld, Trish seems to have fallen and can't get up, and Nightmare returns again for the last time, and in the middle of the fight, Trish backstabs you. Nightmare is defeated, Dante saves Trish because a pillar almost crushed her, and she asks why he saved her life, and it was because... Because you look like my mother. Now get out of my sight. The next time we meet, it won't be like this. Making his way to the main room, he challenges Mundus. Mundus shows that he has captured Trish and captures Dante off guard. About to give the killing blow, Trish now returns the favor, and Dante gets fucking mad and transforms into Sparta. Where we have a shmup section. After that section, Mundus strikes Dante down and he goes back to his normal form. And here we have the final fight with Mundus. He gets defeated and crumbles and fades out. Back in the hall where Trish is at and we have the most iconic scene from the game. I should have saved you. should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! Dante gives the amulet to Trish and put the Sparta next to her. Now that the big bat is defeated, since this was kinda originally a, created as a Resident Evil game, uh, a Resident Evil escape ensues. Making it back to the room where the plane, the floor collapses and Mundus appears once more. And Dante tries to put an end to Mundus, where he hears his mother's voice. And Trish appears, and she gives Dante her power. And he takes out Mundus with the power of gun. It looks like we have a winner. Jackpot. Yeah. 
With Mundus defeated, they both embrace each other, and she starts tearing up with Dante, dropping the line, Trish, devils never cry. A plane drops down from the ceiling, and they escape from the island, exploding the background. Back in the city, Dante renames his business to Devils Never Cry, and Trish picks up the phone for a new mission, and credits roll. The story itself is absolute cheese, especially by the end. For the game, I say it's pretty good. There isn't much to say other than I found it kind of weird how Dante feels about his Trish. Kind of feels like a weird Oedipus complex, but I digress. But other than that, it's fine. Moving on. Control-wise, it's a simple game. You press triangle to attack, and you hold R1, and at the same time you press the square button to shoot. While aiming, you have the ability to dodge roll. It kind of breaks the game with some weapons. You can press L1 to activate Devil Trigger Mode, a hyper mode of some sorts, where you do more damage and it also heals. Not by much, but every little helps. Since this game can be sometimes unforgivingly difficult, especially with some enemies. But like I said before, you can kind of cheese most of the enemies with the grenade launcher. And yeah, the static camera really doesn't help, but it's doable. And since the game is rather short, it's actually pretty tolerable. The game is about 67 hours long for a first timer like me. And it's a fun time. Now, since the original game was a PS2, a lot of assets are in 4x3, and I'm glad they kind of kept it at that, even though it kind of looks weird sometimes, but it's fine. And I think it still holds up really good. Overall, the first Devil May Cry hasn't aged super gracefully. It's still fine, and I enjoyed my time. It's a good game. Now let's move on to the second game of the collection, Devil May Cry 2. But that's for next time. Neutral special, he wields a gun. Devil May Cry 2, considered to be one of the worst Devil May Cry games, and the other being DMC Devil May Cry. After playing both campaigns, I agree. Kind of. And I'll get to it. But yeah, Devil May Cry 2 is infamous with a lot of close friends wishing me good luck to play this game, so... Yeah. It also doesn't help that all of my friends want me to play 3, and because of this, my entire Discord has been full of Virgil posting. But I'll get to Devil May Cry 3 when I get to it. Released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, it is a, and I'm using air quotes here, hack and slash. Like the game that came before it, except this time, the guns in this one are incredibly overpowered, and can be used to take down pretty much everything, especially in Devil Trigger mode. That pretty much just drains any enemy's life. The game is split into two discs for some reason. Disc 1 is Dante's campaign, the longest one, while disc 2 is for the newcomer and only appearance in the series to my knowledge. Lucia. No, wait, apparently she appears in Devil May Cry 5, Before the Nightmare, which is a novel, so... It doesn't count. And in the HD collection, you just pick who you want to play in the main menu. Honestly, this game shouldn't have been two discs. But what do I know? I'm not a game developer. Anyway, the only history I have with Devil May Cry 2, if you can call it history, is the game Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. I say Devil May Cry 2 specifically because that's what it says in the back of the box. This is technically the game with a famous featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series badge in front of the box, but that was only in the European version where it's known as Shin Megami Tensei's Lucifer's Call. In Nocturne, Dante is a boss. He's just kind of there. And he has a pretty cool battle theme. Ah! 
Thank you, Tracky, for the save file for I can record this small segment. Thank you. Anyway, let's begin with what little story there is. Well, since there are two campaigns, let's start with Dante. In a museum, there was a narration about how there was hope for the human world thanks to Sparta. In this museum, there's this lady, Lucia, breaking and taking a coin, it seems. Suddenly demons, and Dante falls from the roof and wipes them out. Apparently, Lucia called Dante here, and she throws a dagger at the map and leaves. So, we begin the island of... Vidimarli, also known as Dumari Island. Yeah, let's go with that. Where Dante sees a house and jumps down from a tower. So off to that house Dante goes. On the way there, demons appear. Arriving at the house, Lucia is there, and then the house explodes. And Lucy is looking for a matier, and this old lady walks out of the ground, and she knows Dante, and apparently fought along with Dante's dad, Sparta. And then she asks Dante to help out to take out this man named Arius. Dante is now two-faced from Batman and flips a coin. Dante goes through a catacomb and learns the power of flight in Devil Trigger. Leaving the catacombs, we end up in a town city thing, where we have our first boss, the Orangera. He dies with the power of a gun, and then Dante moves on. With a couple of minutes after, we have our second boss, the Jokaga, the Jokak Glum, who also dies by the power of a gun. A bike appears and Dante takes it and rides it off to the city, where he fights infested tanks and an infested helicopter. Okay. Once the infected chapter gets taken down, Dante jumps from a building and now has to fight this thing, the Nephasterus. With the power of gun, Nephasterus becomes a floating head, and now with the power of sword and gun, he gets defeated. A helicopter with the words Ouroboros flies over and arrives at an oil ring or something. Now, inside the facility, for some reason, going through it, Dante ends up in a helipad where Arius is there. He snaps in fingers and spots a Final Fantasy XIV boss. Guns and Sue and Ferritaris is taken down. Resident Evil escape sequence, and Dante escapes via the Dante cycle. Meanwhile, at some sort of ruin, he fights some moth monster thing named the Necto named the Noctoparan. Jesus, these names. <sighs> Once gunned, Dante enters another catacomb. Inside, he fights the Volverk, an enemy with two wolves that attack you. Once defeated by the power of RPG, Dante moves on and gets the drop on Lucia. Lucia asks Dante to take the MacGuffins to Matia. Then, BDSM ball and chain guy appears, the Plutonian. And down he goes. Leaving the catacombs, Dante meets up with Matier and informs Dante that Lucia went to go fight Arius, and asks Dante to help her. He flips a coin and goes. Meanwhile, in this office building, Lucia is captured in a wall, and Dante appears and gives the relics to Arius, and Dante challenges him. What? Your swan song will. Gun. Arius tries to attack Lucia and Dante saves her. Well, Arius blows up his own building, and right after that, Lucia informs Dante that Arius created her. And Dante just goes after Arius. But before he can, he must open up this gate to the underworld, I think. And when it opens, the Phantom from Devil May Cry 1 appears and then get boomstick to death. An opening appears and Dante faces a horde of incoming demons and then makes it in. Inside is the office building, elevators and all. And all this is a mook rush with the only boss throughout there being Volverk 
And after the final elevator section, Dante fights the logo from WWE Unforgiven 2001, the Trismagia. One firearm later, Dante meets up with Arius and turns out Dante switched an important medallion for his weird coin. Pseudo final boss go! And after a good devil trigger machine gun, Dante shoots him out of a building and meets up with Lucia. And then she wants Dante to kill her because she feels bad because she was created by Arius, suddenly opening to the door of the demon world. Dante and Lucia has a conversation of who's going to go in. And she is concerned if he goes in, he might never return and starts tearing up. And Dante says the line, No, devils never cry. And he flips a coin again, and then he goes to the demon world. But before he that, he gives the coin to Lucia. And with that, we have a mishmash of all the bosses throughout the game so far. Argosax, the Chaos. Once defeated, he turns to his second and final form, the Despair Embodied. Finally, Gun takes down the demon. Okay, yeah, that was a pretty cool scene. And with that, Dante drives off in the Dante cycle. And, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no credits. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the Dante disc, all right. Okay, moving on to the Lucia disc. Thankfully, Lucia's campaign is much shorter than Dante. Dante has 18 missions, while Lucia only has 13. And Lucia's story kind of goes through the same beats as the game, just in a slightly different order and in different areas. Lucia's disc began the same way, museum and everything. This time, she makes way to the tower instead. Inside the tower, she gains the power of flight in her own Devil Trigger mode. At the top of the tower, she fights the ball and chain guy, and then picks up a relic. Heading back to her home, we get the cutscene where the house explodes. Same cutscene where Dante flips a coin. Mattia asks if Lucia has found the other relics, and now there's only missing one. Lucia heads over the city, fights a tentacle monster, arrives at the city, and then fights an infested tank. She sees the Ouroboros helicopter fly away, and then she makes chase. She goes to the facility and meets Arius. And Arius informs that he created Lucia, and her real name is Kai. Ki, the most ancient bird. Some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. And orders her to give him the Arcana. And then makes her fight the moth demon thing. Then she appears in another catacomb and starts having an existential crisis. And here is where we have the dreaded water levels. I didn't really talk about this much in the first Devil May Cry game because it felt like rather of a footnote and it really didn't overstay its welcome. Yeah, the controls were a bit bad and it was only in first person mode, but it was doable and rather short. But this on the other hand, it's big, empty, linear underwater areas kind of just feel like padding for no reason. But again, it's nothing really too bad. Anyway, through this underwater section, Lucia has her own boss fights, the Toy Besu. And it's alright, I guess. Unless your controller battery dies mid fight, so yeah. Escaping the water ruins, we end up in another fight with a ball and chain guy. After that, we get the cutscene where she gives the relic to Dante. Meanwhile, at the main office again, she confronts Arius and a fight ensues. And like before, Lucia ends up captured. Dante arrives and the building explodes. Dante goes off and does his own thing. Mattia talks to Lucia and gives her a pet talk, which is rather nice to be honest. She goes off to open the door to the underworld or something, and before she can, the phantom appears. She hops in the portal and ends up in the demonic building. She fights the same Unforgiven logo, and then it shows that Arius is doing his ritual, and it skips to a post-Arius defeat Dante. The portal opens, Dante flips a coin, and goes in and gives her the coin. Apparently Dante didn't kill Arius, and now he is possessed. And now Lucia has to do it. Once defeated, Arius goes full mental, and Lucia says the line, 
Devils, never cry. And Arius goes full Resident Evil now and has a final form. Arius Argosax. Defeated, he evaporates and Lucia is waiting for Dante. And Matier confirms him saying that Dante will be back since everything was at it as it was with Sparta. Lucia notices that the coin is a double-headed coin. Roll credits, finally. In a post-credit cutscene, she is what I assume to be Devils Never Cry from the first game, just with no Trish around. And you can hear Dante monologuing. Questioning if Dante will ever comes back, she hears a motorcycle and runs out. And, uh... Yeah, that is the story of it. So overall, the story is... Meh. And really, Dante went from a bit of a wisecracking edgelord to an angsty edgelord. And Lucy is fine for what she is and what they gave her to work with. Arius is boring. I totally forgot about him throughout the story until you had to fight him. Dante honestly kind of just feels like he's there, not really doing much. Overall, a very mess story. Gameplay-wise, I am mixed. With Dante, yeah, the joke of it you can just play is as a shooter. And yes, they are correct. You kind of can. It feels like using the sword feels like it has no impact, and it's only there just to get Devil Trigger. And that's it. Oh yeah, and the Devil Trigger, uh, like I said before, it just drains enemies, like and bosses like crazy. Like, it's kind of just broken. Another quick note, one small upgrade, if you can call it that. You no longer have to go to the menu to switch firearms. Swords you still have to, but at least for guns, it's just a tap of a button. Lucy, on the other hand, you're better off using melee instead of her daggers and grenades. Well, sometimes. I do love her design though, I just wish she played better. It reminds me a lot of Lucia from Street Fighter V. Same thing, love the design, I just not a fan of playing as her. Speaking of the design, once you beat the campaign with either Dante or Lucia, you get an alternate costume branded by Diesel. So yeah, that's neat. You also unlock Bloody Palace mode, and Hard mode once you complete the game. And once you beat the game in Hard mode, or use a code like I did, you can play as Trish. And she plays much closer to Dante from Devil May Cry 1. So that's pretty neat. And uh, yeah, that's Devil May Cry 2. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be much worse, but I still played it through completely. It feels like the whole game is a footnote, but it isn't bad. It's just meh. Anyway, with that finally out of the way, let's move on to the game that all my friends wanted me to play from the beginning. Devil May Cry 3's Dante's Awakening. It's the young kids! So, Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening is the third installment of the Devil May Cry series, this time being a prequel to the original Devil May Cry. In a way, there are three different versions of Devil May Cry 3, the original version released in 2005 for the PlayStation 2, the special edition that was released later that year, and the one that's included in the HD collection, and finally we have the Nintendo Switch version of the special edition. Based story-wise, they're all the same. Game features and difficulty on the other hand are completely different. In the original release, the difficulty in normal mode is much higher, so much so that it became the seventh of Game Trailer's top 10 most difficult games. In Special Edition, the differences include a balanced difficulty, a reintroduction to Bloody Palace mode that was introduced in Devil May Cry 2, a new boss fight, and of course, Virgil mode. Who was Virgil? We'll get to him later. And then we have the Nintendo Switch version, which is exactly the same as the original Special Edition version, just with a new gameplay mode called Freestyle, which, to my knowledge, started in Devil May Cry 4, but I haven't played that yet, so... Soon, though. Gameplay-wise, my god, this game is a godsend compared to Devil May Cry 2. While 1 gives it a bit of leeway since it was the first game in the series, and since it's kind of built originally as a Resident Evil 4, it can get some slack. It has growing pains. Devil May Cry 2, though... No. Let's start with one of the biggest changes in the series. Styles. Starting from the beginning, you have 4. Trickster, a style that lets you dodge and gives you invincibility frames when you're evading. This is the one that I kind of just used in my entire first playthrough. Swordmaster, where you can extend your combos with double arms using the circle button instead of dodging. 
Gunslinger, where it's the same as Swordmaster, but this time using the firearms. And the final default one, Royal Guard, where it kind of just turns into a game of Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, because it just becomes pairing the game. There are two bonus styles you unlock throughout the story, Quicksilver, where you get the power of the world, and Doppelganger, also known as two-player co-op mode. So in the base and special edition on the PS2 and the HD collection, you choose to style at the, either at the beginning of the mission or at these divinity statues where you can use red orbs to level up your weapons and health. And Devil Trigger. Something I should have mentioned in uh, both DMC reviews, but better late than ever, I guess. In the Switch version, there is a mode called Freestyle Mode where you can have all the weapons equipped at once, something you can't do in the base game and special edition. You also can just switch any style on the fly, and it's honestly the best version to play. Anyway, that's the basics. Let's move on to the story. Devil May Cry 3 begins with a woman explaining the story of Sparta and how she didn't believe it until she met the sons of Sparta and their eternal fight, with only one of them left standing. And then the phone rings. And then we have our boy Dante answering the phone and saying that they aren't even open yet. Now, this rendition of Dante, he's voiced by Ruben Langdon. I say this rendition because in Devil May Cry 1 and DMC 2, Dante had different voice actors. But Ruben sticks to the rest of the series as the Dante representation, with the exception of Dante from DMC Devil May Cry. Not a million years. Ruben is also known for the current voice of Ken Masters in Street Fighter, and of course, in Street Fighter V, he has a Dante costume. Anyway, outside the building, there's this menacing man who enters, and the man asks him, is he the son of Sparta? And Dante asks where he heard that. He replies from his brother, and then flips the table. Demon appears, and then we get one of the coolest cutscenes in PS2 history. He's getting crazy. Let's rock. Once outside, the building collapses, and Dante puts on his jacket. More demons show up, and then Dante fights this Reaper demon. The Reaper flies off into this ominous tower, and then the man who talked with Dante, Arkham was his name, talks with Dante's brother, Virgil, about how Dante still has the memento from their mother, and then Virgil kills the Reaper. At the bottom of the tower, there's this one chick with a motorcycle and heads towards the tower. Dante also heads towards the tower, and inside there's a three-headed dog demon, Cerberus, who is protecting the entrance, and then Dante starts taunting Cerberus and fights Dante. Once Cerberus is defeated, Cerberus is impressed by Dante and turns into the nunchucks. A motorcycle breaks into the tower, and this woman appears. And she shoots Dante with a missile, and... <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> 
She jumps over Dante and heads in. Meanwhile, at the top of the Virgil Tower, Virgil notices that the woman is in the tower and Arkham knows her. He also drops the line, A storm is approaching. Throughout the tower, Dante fights demons and solves minor Resident Evil puzzles. And after one boss fight later, this fucker appears, the Jester. And he helps Dante open the door. Uh, as you can tell in the PC version of the HD collection here, uh, some of the cutscenes are completely desynced, and it's annoying. Only in the PC version, though. Uh, the Switch version's fine, and the original PS2 version is perfectly fine. It's just the PC port. Thanks, Capcom. There's no need to use violence, devil boy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Better listen to what I to say, lad. This tower here is very sturdy. You see? Your tricks will do no good. No good! Zip it, or I'll pierce that big nose. That could be a problem. There's no need to use violence, devil boy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Better listen to what I to say, lad. This tower here is very sturdy. You see? Your tricks will do no good. No good! Zip it, or I'll pierce that big nose. That could be a problem. Once out the door, Jester spawns these annoying fuckers and then spawns an optional boss fight with the Jester. This fight isn't in the original release, it was added in the Special Edition, and this boss fight appears two more times throughout the Special Edition story. Climbing more of the tower, Dante enters a room with Agni and Rudra. They fight, and once both are defeated, they become a new devil arm. Meanwhile, that woman is out defeating demons in the tower. Moments later, she is prepping, and Arkham shows up, and we found out that Arkham is the woman's father, and he throws her off the tower. Dante ends up catching her, and they have a quick chat, and she shoots him in the head. Twice, actually. And then he walks away. Going through more of the tower, Dante ends up near the top, where Virgil is. They chat, and now we have the fight from the opening cutscene. Once Virgil gets bored with his foolishness, he overpowers Dante and takes his amulet. About to get up, Virgil stabs him again. And then Dante gets fucking mad, and Virgil and Arkham go away. And Dante awakes his Devil Trigger form. Yep. You don't get it until like two and a half hours into the game, and it's behind a pretty hard wall. Anyway, Dante stands up, and the music kicks in. He jumps off the building, and then we get this magnificent cutscene. Alright, wow, that's one hell of a transition. Once Vor, Dante goes through and beats the Leviathan from the inside. Meanwhile, Virgil and Arkham are talking about the demon world. Leviathan comes crashing down and the woman is outside, and then Dante jumps out, covered in blood. He jokes to the woman about a date and they have a shootout. He asks for her name and she replies she doesn't have one. So, Dante just calls her lady. And he jumps ahead and meets up with his witch succubus thing called the Neven. One concert later and she gets defeated just like Cerberus. She becomes a devil arm, and she becomes a sick guitar. We also see Lady finishing some of the demons at the entrance of the tower, 
and then she enters herself. Meanwhile, Arkham and Virgil at the door. Virgil enters and asks why he didn't kill Lady, and then stabs Arkham. And then he animes him, and leaves him to die. Dante, while going through the castle, reaches where Arkham is, and Lady is right behind. Lady, while trying to kill Dante, drops all the exposition. Arkham is slightly alive, and Lady is next to him, and it seems that Arkham was manipulated by a demon named Virgil. And then comforts Lady, and he dies. Ends up where this guy, who smells Parta. His name is Beowulf. They fight, and Beowulf is about to punch Dante, and he throws the sword and damages his eye, making him blind. And he flies away. Meanwhile, when Arkham died, he is gone, but his book is ominously there. Back to Dante, he picks up the mandatory MacGuffin that drains your health. And then the Jester arrives again. And he drops some plot about how the tower is being connected to the demon world, and then he fucks off. So Dante runs to drop off the orb, and then you have another optional boss with the Jester. Continuing throughout, there is another boss fight. Uh, this Knight Rider is called Garion, the Time Steed. You have a small game of chicken and then a full gladiator fight. Garion has the power of the world, and once defeated, he grants you the Quicksilver style, or as I like to call it, the world. Meanwhile, in the Virgil room, Virgil is about to do the ritual and then Beowulf appears. And Virgil pulls an anime and cuts its face. Then he acquires the Beowulf gauntlets. And then he begins his ritual. Dante makes it to the room where Virgil is making his ritual, and they fight. And lots of blood is spilled, and Lady appears and fires her missile and tries to kill Virgil to avenge her father. And then the Jester appears, and it's stronger than Virgil. Turns out the Jester is Arkham. Turns out to get the power of the tower, the blood of a sacrificed virgin woman is needed. So Arkham stabs Lady in the leg. Then the Pincer attack Arkham and then goes up into the tower and Virgil falls. Dante saves Lady and then the tower grows even taller. Right after that, Lady gets determined to kill Arkham, like a true Mishima. And then she goes ahead and then Dante heads out. Also, Dante gets Beowulf from Virgil because it's just there. Heading down back to the ground, Dante fights Lady's motorcycle and then rides it up. He makes it up to the tower and then the bikes explodes, adding to the death. Lady is still climbing the tower. One long ass tower puzzle later, Arkham opens up the gate to the demon world and gains power. A door puzzle later, Dante meets up with Lady in the library and she explains how she has the motivation to kill him. And a fight with Lady happens, and, like any Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 fight, she can't handle the Dante. And then they have a moment, Dante explains what about his motivation, and then Lady gives us her missile launcher, but before she does, she asks him what's his name. A rather touching moment for a crazy action game, I'd say. Later, we see Arkham find the sword from the first game, the Force Edge, and then the two amulets merge into the sword. Dante goes to the tower that's in ruins, and then we have another optional Jester fight. Climbing throughout the tower, he makes it through this room where his shadow takes form, and then fights Dante. With the shadow defeated, Dante gains the new style Doppelganger, which is pretty much just co-op mode. So yeah, Dante climbs up to the Demon World and then goes through a boss rush. We also fight mirrors. No joke. Dante finally makes it to the end of the line, and Arkham has a Devil Trigger mode, but he doesn't really use it and morphs into this Resident Evil blob monster. And we have ourselves a final boss. In the middle of the fight, Arkham goes for a grab, and his arm gets cut off by Virgil, who is here to collect his power. Dante and Virgil team up to take him down together. Both of them stab each other with the weapons and slice him up. They both end it with a jackpot. Jackpot. Not very classy for someone's dying words. With Arkham destroyed, the Force Edge and the Amulets fall to the Abyss, and both Dante and Virgin jump for it. Meanwhile, in the human world, Arkham falls from the sky, and Lady appears. She tries to get sympathy, but then... Goodbye, Father. <gasps> no! Back to the demon world, both Dante and Virgil get their amulets, and Virgil picks up the Force Edge and charges after Dante. And with that, we have the final fight against Virgil. 
With the final blow given to Virgil, they both charge at each other, and Virgil falls to his knees and falls to the abyss. Dante takes the Force Edge and manages to meet up with Lady. They talk how demons will be back soon. And then Dante sheds a tear, he's thinking of what happens, and then drops the line. The devils never cry. I see. Maybe somewhere out there, even a devil may cry when he loses a loved one. Don't you think? Maybe. And then demons appear, and the theme song starts kicking in. And here we have playable credits, where it's a mook rush with a song, Devils Never Cry Play, in the background. And it's fucking glorious. post credits cutscenes, Dante has his Devil May Cry 1 attire, and names his shop Devil May Cry. Meanwhile, in the demon world, Virgil is struggling in a pool of blood, and then he sees Mundus from DMC1. And will Virgil defeat Mundus? No. No, he doesn't. Uh, that gets explained in Devil May Cry 1. He, he doesn't. And that's the main story. The only story if you play the original version. But once you finish the main story, in the special edition, you lock some bonuses. Bloody Palace, which is pretty much an endless battle mode with mooks and bosses. Some costumes like the DMC1 Dante. And we have the Virgil mode. Virgil mode has a tiny bit of story, but you go through all of Dante's campaign with Virgil. And his own special moves and devil arms. He only has one style, Dark Slayer. Ah, fuck. Ah, the edge. Thankfully, all of his devil arms are equipped at the same time and they all play fine. You have the power of God and anime on your side with the Yamato. The Force Edge and Bale will play fine. The Yamato is pretty different from the other two, being exclusive to Virgil, while you have the Beowulf as Dante and the Force Edge is just Dante's Rebellion, Stinger and all. So there isn't much of a story with Virgil, there's only one new cutscene and it's the intro, where Virgil meets Arkham at a library, and Arkham convinces Virgil to go with him, and the others being them at the bottom of the tower, with Virgil pretty much showing off his strength, and that's it. He fights the same bosses as Dante, and he even fights himself, just with a red coat. Virgil also has some costumes, and he's also playable in Bloody Palace mode. And yeah, that's about it. Overall, Devil May Cry 3 is by far the best in the collection. Pretty much with no competition. Devil May Cry 1 is totally fine. It gets a pass because it's the original and it has growing pains. Devil May Cry 2 is a total pass since it's a glorified footnote and nothing else. And with the only good thing that it has, it's the character design and the introduction to Bloody Palace mode. Devil May Cry 3 is just good. And it made me realize why people love the series and yeah, I kicked my ass really hard. But man, it's really, really fun. I will say this though, if you're just going to play one Devil May Cry game from the PS2 era, play Devil May Cry 3 on Switch because it's pretty much the best way to play it. Or if you're going to play the HD collection, play it on the consoles and not the PC since it has a lot of bugs and issues that are yet to be fixed. Actually, fuck it. Play the original PS2 versions like I did. They work. They play fine. Anyway, that was the Devil May Cry HD collection. I am now a total fan of the Devil May Cry series and I'm planning to look into Devil May Cry 4 and DMC Devil May Cry and Devil May Cry after I'm done with these GIF reviews. And I'm looking forward to them. But for now, I have some other genres to play. And I've been Fonzie. You can hit the subscribe button if you want. It helps a lot. Leave a like and follow me on Twitter at Fonzie's Revenge. And right after I started DMC, I started streaming these recording sessions to feel so feel free to hop in at twitch.tv slash fonzman and I'll see you in the next game later.